our next speaker is um, Brian Swistock from Penn State Extension. And uh, you might have saw his name when I gave my presentation this morning. Honestly, Brian was probably the most active person on our work group. Um, and I really appreciate all he put into helping develop that assessment tool. Uh, he's a wealth of knowledge. Um, he's got a great program in Penn State um, on assisting well owners there, which, you know, Penn State or Pennsylvania is the one state that doesn't have well regulations per se. And I think out of that has come a lot of ground roots or grassroots efforts. Uh, and Brian spearheaded a lot of that. And so you see groups active in Pennsylvania that you don't see in other places like um, the League of Women Voters in Pennsylvania has active in, in water and well issues. And I think it's just a uh, it's wonderful what's happened and it shows what can be done. And uh, so and Brian also has uh, a master well owner network, which you'll probably talk about some of those things. But uh, so I'll with further ado, um, Brian's going to talk today about transitioning from in person to online education. Hi, my name is Brian Swistock. I'm a water resources specialist with Penn State Extension in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Management. Today, I'd like to talk to you about some of the work we've done in Pennsylvania to transition some of our water well education from in-person to online education. And I'll talk a little bit about what has caused us to do that. Some of it was by choice and some of it was really by necessity over the last year or so. I also want to acknowledge lots of other folks here at Penn State Extension that have worked on these programs in drinking water and also uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection that's funded a lot of our work on private water wells, and including our master well owner network, which is a volunteer group that I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, just a little bit of background about Pennsylvania and the challenges that we have with private water systems, some of which has been the cause for us to move to online. But we have a very large audience of private well owners in Pennsylvania, roughly 3 million people, about a million households, and they're diverse all across the, the geography of Pennsylvania. So a very difficult and large audience to reach just because of their geographical distribution. We are one of the few states that don't regulate private water supplies in any way, including construction construction, testing, location, you name it. We don't really regulate it other than in a few counties and a few municipalities, but the vast majority of Pennsylvania has no regulations. Our research has shown fairly high rates of contamination, roughly 40% fail a health-based standard and very low rates of awareness of health-based problems, predominantly because of lack of testing. Uh, we find that some businesses do prey on uninformed homeowners and that really creates a very big need for our work to try to educate private well owners so that they can make informed decisions. There's unfortunately a real lack of unbiased information out there for private well owners. And so we try to fill that niche of, of providing that unbiased, unbiased scientific uh, research-based information. We continue to get increasing numbers of inquiries from private well owners every single year. So more and more demand for information, especially unbiased information. And traditionally what we've offered have been the traditional extension products, fact sheets, publications, in-person workshops, conferences for specialty groups, uh, professionals in particular, and then also our volunteer program, which has been meant to really create an army of volunteers out there. And we call it the Master Well Owner Network. It was funded initially by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, CSREES in 2003 and 2004. It's a two-year grant. And since then, it has been funded annually by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection and the Pennsylvania Groundwater Association, along with a number of other partner organizations like uh, the Pennsylvania Rural Water, the EPA, and others that have provided in-kind support for us and also uh, occasional grants to do research. Really, the goal of this program was to create this army of people out there on the landscape who could educate owners of private water systems so that they're capable of making those decisions to protect and improve the quality and quantity of their drinking water. So we've trained over 900 of these folks since 2004. And they've educated over 60,000 private well owners across the state in that time period. So they've been a really an invaluable resource for, for us to uh, expand the reach of our programs. And there have been some online components that I'll talk about with our M1 network. 
So some examples of why transition to online, and it's very ironic for me to be talking about transitioning to online because I've gone into this kicking and screaming probably more than anybody has. I've been in an extension for 34 years. I'm a traditional extension person that likes to talk to people in person. Uh, I've never really been all that fond of online, but over the last several years, I've begun to see uh, the light, you might say, uh, and seen how important online has become in reaching audiences in, in Pennsylvania, and I'm sure the same is true across the country. So just some examples here, we have traditionally done in-person workshops where we call them safe drinking water clinics. We've done these since 1984, so a very long history of doing them. But what we have seen is attendance at those has been stagnant or declining. And that's even when we have tried to add incentives like free water testing, for example. It used to be we could get 30 or 40 people to a clinic even if we didn't do water testing, but now we're lucky to get that many even if we are providing incentives. So we do see a general decline in people's willingness even before COVID occurred for them to come out to in-person workshops. We've seen rapidly increasing interest in online content. Just an example here in 2014, about 2,300 participants in our webinars uh, more than double that by 2016, and uh, it's gone up tremendously even since 2016. And then, of course, over the last year, we've all seen the importance of being online, where we were not allowed to do any in-person workshops anymore. So we had to very rapidly pivot toward online, and we were already doing a lot of that, and we were very fortunate that we had already started to make that transition, but we had to accelerate that, tr that transition very rapidly in 2020 to meet the demand for people for education when we couldn't do anything in person. So some examples I wanna to talk to you about. First of all, our Master Well Owner Volunteer Program, uh, we've seen rapid increase in demand for online formats there. We also, with this program, did in-person workshops from the beginning of this program in 2004 all the way into 2010, we only offered in-person workshops for people to become a trained volunteer. In 2010, we began to dabble with online. We did some very low cost, very basic online training, but we continued to do in-person workshops. And you can see in this bar graph, uh, all of our volunteers were in blue were trained in in-person workshops. So we had a lot in the initial part of this grant because it was a two-year grant. We trained a lot of people right off the bat. But then we kind of stabilized at about 50 volunteers per year. 2010, you start to see some online training. And by 2013, we were completely online. And that's because when we started to offer both, nobody wanted the in-person workshops. Everybody wanted the online. And so we had to cancel all of our online workshops in two, or excuse me, all of our in-person workshops in 2013 and 14 because we couldn't get enough attendance. And we had to increase our offerings of online. So again, that online training that we first started in 2010 was very, very simple. We just recorded webinars, sent out the links to the volunteers, did some very simple quizzes using SurveyMonkey in our case to, uh, to determine their learning and to certify them as volunteers. And then we also made, made these synchronous offerings. So we had cohorts of volunteers. We would have them apply and sign up for a spring and a fall course so that we could go through it with them. And we could even have some live webinars from time to time to go over the content and answer their questions. But it was really a very simple format rather than being very intense of eight hours in a single day, we spread it out with these recorded webinars intermixed with live sessions and trained uh, volunteers very effectively. The course was updated in 2017 because our extension here at Penn State started to put a lot of resources into really improving our online content. So they provided a lot of expertise for us to really update this course and make it much more slick and professional. So we started to incorporate short videos, less text because people want videos, they don't want text. We had automated quizzes now that we didn't even have to go in and grade, they got graded automatically. And we started to deliver this both asynchronously and synchronously in cohorts. What we found was the synchronous method was much preferable and we actually don't offer this asynchronously anymore. People have to sign up for spring and fall cohorts. This is just some pictures showing the course. So you can see mixtures of some of the text, some of the embedded short videos and one of the quizzes. This is just a very small piece of the overall course. 
it's actually six chapters and this is just showing tiny bits of a couple of the chapters that takes people about six to eight hours to complete it and to go through all the quizzes and get certified but uh, we have found that they have really liked that course a lot in fact the evaluations of the online course have even exceeded the in-person workshops we've now evaluated about 300 of our volunteers that have taken the online course every single one of them said they would recommend it almost 90 percent thought it was just the right length 95 percent of them had used the information to actually install bmps on their own private well the advantages of the online course much lower cost less than 50 percent of what we were spending to drive to venues and, and rent venues for in-person workshops and copy materials to give to to the volunteers the big disadvantage though is that lack of interaction you know we're now training volunteers that we never even meet in person um, so it really does demand a lot more interaction via online mechanisms which I can talk about here shortly. It, it required some change in thinking of how we're going to maintain that interaction, even while we're not actually meeting people at workshops. I mentioned the, the short videos that we embed in the course, and those videos have been invaluable also as standalone products. And these are just three to five to maybe seven minutes at the most narrated PowerPoints. And you can create these just in PowerPoint. You don't need anything special, or you can create them in a, another format like Zoom, and you can embed these videos or you can put them right up on the web and people really seem to respond to them. They can be part of a course like we've done or we can make them standalone videos. And again, that shortness really makes them uh, appealing to people, for people really seeking out these short snippet videos to watch rather than reading a four page publication, they'd rather have a three minute video. We've often targeted those to answer a common question, much like extension often does with a fact sheet. We get a lot of questions, for example, about if I have bacteria in my well or spring, how can I solve that? And you can answer that question over and over and over again a million times. But really what it comes down to is you can put it into a three minute video and answer all those questions in one short video. So we did that, for example, with a short video on solving bacteria problems in well and springs. It actually turned out to be a nine minute video. So it's a little longer than we like it to be. But we actually use this video and send it out to anybody who gets their water tested through our water testing lab that has a bacteria problem. And what we found is it greatly reduced follow up questions that people would have. They were often calling us and emailing us saying, hey, I see my test has bacteria. How do I solve that? Well, now we can just embed the link to this video right into the email with their report and say, you know, you had a bacteria problem. Here's a short video that explains how you can solve that. Uh, so it's really a win-win. It provides that information to them when they want it rather than waiting for us to email them back or call them back. But it also um, allows them to engage that information as they need it and learn quickly. And it helps us because we don't have to answer all those emails and phone calls. Uh, some other aspects of the importance of online with the volunteers, as I mentioned, we went from workshops to online. It's important to, to maintain the engagement with those volunteers. And we've done that through online newsletters. We send out quarterly. We've added a ton of content to our website so that we can direct our volunteers to website content uh, so that maybe instead of talking to them on the phone, we can give them a fact sheet that answers the question. And also what's been really important are webinars and webinars are all the rage right now, but we use them as a quarterly offering to our volunteers as a continuing education product. Again, to keep them engaged for not getting that in-person engagement, we need to continually talk to them or I say talk, but uh, communicate with them by email, by the newsletter, by the webinars to constantly keep them engaged and keep them interested in the subject. And so we have we do these quarterly webinars on things like bacteria and manganese and iron and PFAS and radon. So we can pick out specific topics that we couldn't get into a lot of detail in the course, but we can now get into a lot of detail on a webinar. And these are optional, volunteers don't have to attend, but we find a very high percentage either look at the live webinar or more of them actually look at the recording. And we post these recordings to our website so that they can go back in and view them as needed. Now, transitioning away from the volunteer program, looking at some other audiences, uh, we've also looked at online offerings for professionals and specifically real estate. Uh, we've for a long time tried to educate real estate folks, whether it's realtors or home inspectors, appraisers, whoever it might be, about private water systems and how to deal with those in a home and how to evaluate them. Uh, so what we do is take that 
master well owner course and we just adapted it we took out some of the information that was specific to volunteer work we had a whole chapter on volunteer work and we instead added ceu certification within this so that a realtor or some other real estate person can go through this course learn all about private water systems and also get ceu credits for their profession so this has been very popular this graph at the bottom is, is actually kind of remarkable uh, in 2019 when we first developed this course we didn't have very many people take it because we really hadn't marketed it very much. But in 2020, when COVID hit, our university and our Penn State Extension decided to provide a lot of our online courses free. And they did a lot of marketing of those courses. And you can see what happened just with this particular course for real estate folks. We had over 1,400 people take the course when we had this special offering. Now, when it went back for sale later and now in 2021, we've obviously seen a big reduction, but still, uh, more people are taking it than were before. And it created a lot more awareness, uh, but certainly offering it free just provided an incredible number of people that were interested in learning. And again, this course was very similar to the volunteer course where we had embedded videos, content specific to realtors that they could learn about private water systems to evaluate, for example, how to do testing, what to test for during a real estate transaction, how to interpret the results, how to fix problems with private water systems. We've also transitioned online with other professionals like hydrogeologists and water well drillers. And we've always offered what's called the Pennsylvania Groundwater Symposium. Traditionally, it's been an in-person conference from 2001 through 2019. It's been offered in various places, but it's been an in-person conference full day with presentations, lunch, it's been at a conference center, sometimes with a half day field trip provided. The major draw is it provides again CEUs for hydrogeologists and other state agency people and professionals. We get about 250 attendees, again, mostly professionals. In 2020, we had to cancel it because we couldn't do an in-person workshop. So now in 2021, we're providing it as a virtual conference. And we're doing this by pre-recording the presentations, just like we're doing for this conference right now. We pre-record those presentations uh, to reduce technology issues with live uh, presentations online. We use live Q&A, though, to provide that engagement with the speakers, again, just like this conference. And we use a pre-symposium general talk on hydrogeology instead of a field trip. And what we have found with this uh, course in particular or this symposium is that the registration numbers went up by 15 percent and the cost for the symposium went down by 50 percent so again we haven't fully evaluated this yet to find out what the participants think and whether they would still prefer in person i'm not saying that this is the best thing since sliced bread and it's going to replace in-person conferences uh, but it does have a, a an appeal to people because again, they can look at these things whenever they have time. They can still do the live Q and A, they can get their CEUs, they don't have to travel and they therefore cost a lot of less money and it costs us a lot less money to do the conference. So there's, there's gonna be going forward a lot more people doing virtual conferences for sure. A lot of them will revert back to in-person, ours might, I don't know. We'll see what the participants think and we just don't have the data on that yet. Another big one has been our safe drinking water workshops that I mentioned earlier. These are intended for the public. So this is basically a one to two hour workshop where we take that big course that we have for our volunteers and boil it down into one or two hours of basic content for private well owners. And again, we've done this since 1984. We've offered incentives sometimes like on-site testing um, to try to increase attendance, but also to give us a more impact from the extension perspective, making sure people get their water tested is an important thing we wanna get done. And if we offer that testing, of course, we can accomplish that. Now in 2020, again, we had to cancel all of these. All of these in-person workshops were canceled and we had to pivot very quickly to doing these online. We had not planned on doing that. And so what we did first off was we thought, okay, we have a database of private well owners in the state from all the past programs that we've done. And we had a lot of email addresses so we can market these programs out to well owners, at least the people that we've had experience with in the past very quickly. So in April, 2020, shortly after COVID, we offered one of these one hour drinking water clinics online as a webinar and had 342 people register for it. We've never had that many register for an in-person workshop. Now, not all of them attended and we find that very consistently with webinars is that when people sign up, 
50 or 60 percent might attend but that's because they're learning that they typically get a recorded version as well that's what we do at least it's our tradition to send out the recording to people that sign up whether they attend or don't and so a lot of people watch the recording instead of attending live and that's fine they're starting at getting that basic information they're just not having the opportunity for q a so that's about 10 times more people than typically come to one of our live workshops one of the drawbacks though is we couldn't do the testing, which again was one of the big impacts that we want to take from these workshops. It's one of the things that we use to show our worth, right, is that we are giving this information out, but what effect are we having? And when we're offering testing, we can show that effect very easily. With just doing it online, it was a little bit harder to do that. And what you see here are the graph of the drinking water clinics over time with the green showing attendees and the blue showing water tests. And you can see last year that while our attendees went way up, our water testing was down quite a bit. And the only reason we had any water testing there was some very specific programs that we offered uh, that required some water testing. And I'll, I'll talk about how we did those. But we felt it was really important to try to start incorporating water testing into these online webinars, since that seems to be the future, right? We're gonna do more of these. We still need to be able to do some testing. So what we did was adapt even further and said, okay, now we're gonna do that one hour webinar, but incorporated into that, we're gonna teach people not only the basics of private well management, but we're gonna talk about how to collect water samples and how they can actually get water samples to us. And we did that in two ways. We either mailed the kits to them and we used UPS shipping to do that with a UPS return label with the kit. So we could ship the sample to them with a UPS return mailer that they could just put right back on the kit and ship it back to the lab overnight mail. And that costs about $15 per sample to add that shipping on. Or if we didn't want to take on that cost, we could just have a, a location in the county where people could come and get their kit and then another day when they could bring it back and drop it off and then we would take it to the lab for analysis. So we've done both of those systems. Uh, both of them have advantages and disadvantages, but ultimately we're just trying to get samples to labs while we still have this webinar content being offered. And then we've provided interpretation for them by either doing a follow-up webinar live where we have a date and time where they can come back online once they've gotten their water test results and we can go through the water test report with them and show it on the screen and talk about what it means or we can just record that and email it with their results so they get the recorded webinar of the interpretation and then we don't have to do a follow-up webinar other than to just offer one for question and answers and that's what we've been doing more recently is giving them the recorded webinar with their results maybe 20 to 30 minutes and then saying, hey, if you still have questions, you can come back to this website on this date and time or offer a series of dates and times. And we're just gonna answer questions for you at that time. So what we have found um, has been big success with that. Actually, it's been working very, very well for us to actually still get that water testing done, uh, but have online content. The other thing that we've done is offer those continuing education type webinars that we do for volunteers, but offer those for well owners also. And so we've done a series of those. We did one series in early 2020, one in mid 2020. Now we're in a third series of those. And they're on, on special topics again, like just bacteria or iron and manganese or PFAS. And we can then do a follow-up evaluation by email to get the impacts. And so these are some of the topics we've used for those. Uh, and we, I don't have the third series on here that we've just started, but this is for the first two series. For the first series, we had um, 958 unique registrants, 382 registrants for the most recent one. And you can see the number of attendees is generally about half to maybe a little less than half of the number of registrants. But still, a lot of those people that are registering are getting the content through watching the recorded versions of them. So this has been a really great way, a very simple way. It takes very little time. Just record webinars or offer live webinars and have people sign up for them. Uh, no cost in our case, but you could charge for them perhaps a nominal fee if you wanted to. And they're able to get this content very, very easily. And we can still get the impacts by doing a follow-up email evaluation of them after the webinars are done. And what we have found is impact wise, we've been able to generate great impacts even by transitioning completely to online. So this is a survey we did of over a thousand people. We had about a 24% response. 
and the numbers or percent in this case of people who did different things like spread the word or got their water tested or maybe got their water tested more than we had tested in the workshop. They visited the website, they solved a problem, they improved their construction of their water supply, they established a water wellhead protection area, and there's other things I could have put on here that are a little bit less common. But ultimately what we found was about three quarters of people take action even after watching something online. And that's the exact same thing we find if we do an in-person workshop. So the impacts really are about the same, especially if we can incorporate that water testing into this program, uh, then we have that built-in impact of already getting the water testing done. So in summary, um, again, we we started dabbling with online content back in 2010. Our college and our university really wanted us to, to really go much quicker into online by 2017 and that really prepared us for covid and we had to accelerate even more in 2020 but we were already going down the road and had some advantages in that respect uh, and the advantages of online cheaper and easier a lot less travel for people like myself i don't have to travel all over pennsylvania i can sit at home and give all this content and i'm not getting home at one o'clock in the morning after driving three hours from across the state. The content can be available 24 seven by recording it. And we get very similar impacts. The disadvantages is that lo loss of engagement and interaction, especially with older audiences that can be important. Uh, and also an important thing I didn't really talk about much, internet availability can be an issue. There are some areas of our state where internet is just not very good. And so in those areas, we have to think about going back to in-person when we can. And when it's safe to do that, we'll have to focus on those areas in particular where we have older audiences and more rural audiences where internet's less available. That's where we're still gonna have to focus an awful lot of uh, our in-person content. Also, another thing I'll mention just from my own experience is I talked about the drinking water clinics and how in-person they were often two hours. And when we transitioned online, we made them one hour. And even one hour is a lot for online content. I find that personally, where if I'm watching a talk, there's a big difference between 30 minutes and an hour and a huge difference between an hour and two hours of trying to just stay engaged and interested. And so shorter is often better trying to boil it down to just the most important components and maybe make that online webinar 30 to 60 minutes and, and probably not more than 60 minutes where you're gonna find that you may lose people and, and people just can't keep their attention span that long on a screen as opposed to being in person. So I hope you enjoyed this and hope it was helpful. This is some of our online content you can find at our extension site, just extension.psu.edu slash water and then slash drinking and residential water. You can also just Google Penn State Extension Drinking Water and it'll bring you to this page. All of our online content is there, including the courses, our short videos, our online articles that we've created now. Uh, so you can get more of a feel for the different offerings that we've created. So I hope this has been helpful. I look forward to answering your questions during the Q&A session. Thanks. Hey, Brian, uh, very good. Uh, you know, we've, we've run very similar programs in a lot of ways. We do the short videos, we have uh, webinars that are live. We don't do testing uh, with our program, and, you know, it's larger scope, I guess. Um, but it was really interesting. Um, one of the things you said about your conference um, in person versus virtual. Um, which do you prefer now that you've done both? You know, I, I know how we feel, <laughs> and it's a it's a struggle both ways. Yeah, and it's interesting because I mentioned in there that we didn't have the data. We now do have the data from that conference. We have finished that first offering of it being online, and what we found was the people who attended loved it. They loved the online. And we asked them, would you prefer online or in person next year? And online overwhelmingly won. Um, so the, the, the uh, people attending liked the online. I think what we'll probably do is some sort of hybrid where we'll maybe offer a field trip for people that really want some interaction and something in person, but we'll still do most of the content online because the cost is so much lower. And I said 15%, we actually ended up with 50% more people for our yeah. attendance. Um, so huge increase in attendance, a lot less costs. It's, it's a big win all around. I, as I said in the talk, I'm still a person that likes to talk to people in person. So I'm mm -hmm. always going to prefer that. But I think we have to look at that kind of data and say we would be insane to not respond to that data and give people what they want. Not necessarily what I want, but what the majority of people want. Sure. Well, we're considering even for our conference next year whether or not we should um, we plan to have it in person, but whether we're going to stream 
or maybe we'll see. Um, that's one of the things there's, I'm going to talk about at the end today is an evaluation of this conference, and we need everyone to respond just like uh, to the same types of questions. Um, Jennifer had a question for you, and so I'm going to throw that up here. Have you done any intentional outreach to or had success engaging the medical community in Pennsylvania? Um, very limited, and it's it's yeah. been a challenge for us. Uh, we're always looking for ideas on that. We have a current grant where we're trying to improve that. We're trying to get those partnerships with the medical community. The only time we really had success with that was when Marcella Shale really got going, and everybody was interested in Marcella Shale. Then we had an inroad with the medical community to talk about Marcella Shale and what were some of the health concerns. So we had some success and a teachable moment where we kind of threw in some private well stuff while we were talking about Marcella Shale. But just getting them interested in private wells, boy, uh, been a struggle big time for me in my career. Well, and we're really, you know, on Tuesday we had uh, Carolyn Murray from New Hampshire. Um, she's uh, a medical doctor and has started doing some of that work and trying to break down some of those barriers. And so, you know, that's what we're hoping to get involved in as well, because it's clear that um, well owners will listen to their doctor. And that's really why it's so important for us to try to reach to them, that's for sure. Absolutely. Um, so I, I wanted to ask the other thing is, are there any, I know with water operators, there's certain, I was on the board for our Illinois Section AWWA, there's certain classes that you can't really teach in uh, virtually. You have to be hands-on. Um, do you find anything with your well owner training or uh, especially your uh, master well owners? Is there anything that you lose by doing it virtually other than the interaction? Um, anything that's better to do in person? Um, you know what I well, mean? Yeah, I think that's almost specific to a person, how they learn. That's like true. for instance, with our workshops, we found that we could have well drillers there and we had demonstration water wells at the workshops where a well driller could sit there and just go through the water well and the pieces of it and how they operate. And, and man, our volunteers just ate that up. They okay. loved it. Um, and that you just can't replicate that very right. easily online. You can show videos and things, but it's just not quite the same as being in person. Right. No, I agree. And uh, we, I feel the same way. It's just a, you know, but it is a trade-off. But if yeah. you're getting to more people, um, that's certainly an advantage. Um, I'm gonna, I haven't read this yet here. Uh, okay, I'm going to pull this up. I haven't read the whole thing, so sorry. Brian, great presentation. On one slide, you showed terrific increase in training participation due to online format. But in the same year event, you received very little samples. Uh, do you see this as a win? I think you, I think you answered that in the talk, but uh, feel free. Well, yes, yeah, so that in that particular case, we had so many more people because we started offering webinars without the testing. And the only the little bit of testing we had was only because we had some special projects where we pretty much had to get testing done and we did it ourselves. Um, what we're seeing right now, we're in the middle of a project where we are doing webinars with that testing option where people come and pick up sample bottles and drop them off. And so far it's going very well. So I think that we're gonna be able to increase participation and increase our water testing. One thing I didn't mention, uh, I think was brought up earlier in another talk that was, uh, we find it very difficult to give water tests away. And I think everybody does. And there's just a lot of people that are very suspicious. And we have, we have counties that have 30,000 private water supplies that we can't give away 40 water tests in no matter how much we saturate the market with with advertising, we just can't give them away. And there's just a lot of issues with people trusting that you're not going to give the data to somebody and have it used against them. All right. Well, um, we're after two. And so I think we're going to move on. Um, thank you. It's good to see you. Um, good to see you. Yeah. And I appreciate you giving a presentation today. So Thanks. great talk. And I, that's certainly useful information for a lot of folks who are trying to do this kind of work. So thank, thank you. Thank you.